It is certainly my hope, and I'm sure all faithful Christians hope to dwell with Jesus evermore. Do we wish for eternity? Do we desire to lay our battle-scarred armor down and to be in a glorified state with God in a place that's beyond the mortal mind to grasp? We ought to. It's part of that which will drive us to greater service to have that wish and that longing. But it's important to understand that when you take your New Testament, it's been often pointed out that most of it has to do with keeping Christians saved. Most of it has to do with after you've been baptized into Christ. And that's significant. Because just out of experience in my lifetime, how many people have been baptized into Christ and then one way or the other, they get caught back up in the ways of the world or get caught up in a certain sin or sins and they cease to be what the Bible describes as a faithful child of God. When you look at Luke 15... Uh, you'll find the record of the prodigal son. He goes to his father. He asks for his inheritance. He takes it. He goes out into the world, living on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. He wastes it in his righteous living. And, of course, that's one way to depart from the service of God, to become unfaithful. But, of course, we also know there are many other ways to do that. In that same account, you have the elder brother. He was just as lost as his younger brother. Inward impurity was his spiritual disease. The prodigal son's sin was really not as tragic, and there's a reason for that. All sin and what it does to man is tragic, but not as tragic. Because the elder brother didn't recognize his sin. The younger brother came to his senses and knew he was a lost uh, person, knew that his actions was contrary to God's will, knew what to do about it to get back where he ought to be. The older boy was content to be outwardly pure while he was contaminated within. And though he stayed with the father, his disposition of heart was not at all what ought to be. Now each one of us, children of God, should follow the inspired counsel of the great apostle Paul. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Notice again as I've re commented several times that the word let is a command. You do this. And of course every word in the Bible is designed to help us go to heaven and to members of the church then we must always be taking stock of our mindsets, our actions, what we do and don't do. And I think one of the major reasons that some members of the church fall away is because they do not have the ability to believe that they could. Now, they could form that ability, but in their mind, well, I'm fine. What lack I yet? We're exhorted to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. That's just as much a part of being faithful as it is to observe the acts of worship in this assembly today. Paul realized the frailties of the flesh by admitting that even he could be a castaway after having preached the truth to others. 1 Corinthians 9 27. By the way, the Greek word castaway there means void of present testimony. Robbed of future reward. You know, it's so thrilling to be around people when they're baptized into Christ for the mission of sins. To see them rise from the watery grave of baptism, happy, and we're all happy for them. Knowing their sins are remitted. Knowing they're members of the church because the Lord added them to the church. But then what happens, and without the Bible's teaching, without the implication of the Bible, since most of the New Testament's written to Christians to keep them faithful, just from my own observations in life, to see so many gradually fall away. How many young people, and I'll just say over the last 25 years, have I known who grew up in homes that were supposed to be faithful to God, and yet when they got out on their own, as we say, in time they just walked away. 
And you know when that happens, they never had much of a confidence in God based upon their own personal study of the Bible. They were sort of riding their mom and daddy's coattails. And I want you to think about the fact that it is a terrible thing to consider one who has known the truth, who's lived the truth, and then for whatever reason, they got back in the way they were in the world. Peter talked about that in 2 Peter chapter 2, and it's a horrible picture. It was meant to be a horrible picture. It was meant to strike fear in people's hearts. And by the way, this is a letter written to Christians, you know. And in verse 20 of 2 Peter 2, Peter writes, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of Christ or the Lord. Now notice that you escape the ways of the world, the pollutions of the world, the sin of the world through proper knowledge, the knowledge of the Lord. That's the gospel. Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. Then the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. To know the truth, to have the truth prick you in your heart that you're a sinner, to know how to gain forgiveness of sins, to obey the gospel, and then let the affairs of this world take up more interest than the affairs of the kingdom of heaven. I've seen that over and over again. And some parents who maybe are attending services all the time in their daily activity, there's very little of being interested in the kingdom of heaven. They reduced down their service to God as being essential by just simply Monday, Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night attendance. And we're not uh, lessening the importance of those things. They're very important. But if you're, that's all there is to it in your connection with God, what's going on on Monday and Tuesday and all day Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday? We mark too much of an importance on, well, I'm in all the services, so what else is there to do? No wonder then most of the New Testament is written to those who have been baptized into Christ, those who have been added to the church by the Lord. The early church faced exactly what we do, or you wouldn't have those letters and that amount of letters written to members of the church. And I must say, what caused that very bad situation that we read about when you read through the letters, how many times members of the church have gotten themselves all mixed up in all sorts of things. I don't know why we're surprised when members of the church get all mixed up in all sorts of things today. Don't we read our New Testaments and see how they got mixed up when the New Testament was still being revealed? They make poor choices, never considering the consequences of those choices. One choice that's a wrong choice can radiate out and permeate everything about a person's life. So why do members become unfaithful? Why do they engage in sin once they've been cleansed of their sin, once they've been added to the church, once they are considered children of God, they have the hope of heaven, and they sing songs like, Upon Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie too. Our possessions really lie there. Are we really by our actions and our thinking laying up treasures in heaven? There's a lack of real conversion with some people to begin with. They've never been taught, as they were taught the way of salvation, what all is expected to change in their thinking, in their plans, and their purposes, their lives. They don't really understand what it means to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. They make plans for the here and now for jobs or schooling or whatever it is without any concern for what that does to them when it comes to the church and they're faithful to it. Now that can only say, well, that's where their heart is. That's where their concern is. For by their fruits you shall know them, our Lord taught us. The word convert suggests a change of life due to a new determination of learning what life really is, life in the flesh on earth to get ready for heaven, that everything is passing rapidly on this earth. We're what one heartbeat away from eternity. And, uh, and that's just the way it is. We need to know why Paul said in Romans 12 that our reasonable service, first of all, comes when we understand there's a renewing of the mind before there can ever be a true conversion of the life. And that mind is renewed through understanding the will of heaven is 
what is there different about me now and my plannings and my purposes and my aspirations and my goals now that I have obeyed the gospel of Christ? See, all of that had to be determined back before you repented in the plan of salvation. And maybe because the United States in times past had so much of the society and culture in the world that even supported Christianity. We didn't think a lot about that, but that was wrong even then. It's just far worse now as to the impact. Of the, thing, the affairs of this present world and the way government and school and society and culture and most of the people are acting, there's no support for the person to be a Christian. Ridicule, possibly actual persecution, that grows more every day. Ridicule's already here. To the Corinthians, Paul said, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Well, when a person rises from the water to the grave of baptism, aside from knowing God in heaven has forgiven him of every sin, what is there about the person that changes? Granted, the earlier in life that one obeys the gospel, maybe the less there is to give up and the less there is to take on. But when a person has, has become a Christian, there's a change. There's a change in action and purpose. The new creature is really a new creature, not in that God has forgiven him and he's now pure in that way. That's very important. The rest of it can't take place unless that happens. But it means in our plans and purposes and our will and what we're doing with our lives, are we still going to do the same thing before we are baptized? After we are baptized? Notice how he says further, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. New goals, new purposes, new practices, new outlook on life, new viewpoint of myself, my family. How is it new? Well, I'm letting God change my ways. How does that happen? I go to the Bible and learn how to view things. I don't know how to view life except that God tells me. And I don't know how he tells me except that I go study his word. As Jesus taught, though, some fail to count the cost of being a Christian. And they do that, they don't do it, I should say, prior to obeying the gospel of Christ. They're really not converted. After baptism, they see the gigantic challenge of living for the Lord that is set before them. And their courage wavers. And their interest grows cold. Because they have not counted the cross before they ever begun to obey the gospel. Now, I know some people can count the cost and still when trouble starts, they give up. But I don't know how a person lives a faithful Christian life without courage to do what he knows is right. You know, all of us weren't called upon to be as young David to face physically a giant. But the example of David in doing it by faith, since he was right, God was with him and he would give him the wherewithal to overcome that Goliath, then how does that teach me? Well, I don't know what the Goliath is in my life all the time, but I know if I'm set upon doing things God's ways, the Bible sets out that way, whatever that Goliath or more than one Goliath might be, I have the wherewithal to face him. But I don't have the wherewithal if I do not have the grit to put my feet down and get out there and get with it. You know what you'll start doing? It's Buddy's problem. It's somebody else's problem. Oh, no, it's your problem. David had Goliath to face. It was, it was, he was the one that to do it. And he didn't try to say, well, I, I told them this and I told them that. No, it's what you do. It's what you do. It's what you will in your mind to do and you put it into action. That's what makes a faithful child of God. So, so such people just simply don't endure to the end that they may be saved. As Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, verse 13. And yet it's necessary to endure. But it's not easy. You still endure. But it's hard. You still keep doing what you know is right. But it hurts. You still keep doing what's right. That's what's lacking a lot of things in this country and the whole world today. It's, we do what's easy to do. But when it challenges us, when it demands of us a change of mind, outlook, and planning, and a change of our conduct, well, that's just asking too much. And this is a falling away. It's how it works. 
we need to have more depth, and I speak brotherhood wide, in the preaching of the gospel, in the examination of the truth, in pinpointing sermons that drive the points home about our individual conduct. Sinners must be converted to Christ, truly converted to Christ as the Bible defines it, and I've been talking about. We should begin immediately to stress the duties that are also privileges of people once they are Christians. To be of Christ, what does it mean in thought, word, and action? What is really the difference in me right now than before I obeyed the gospel? And if you say, well, I go to church all the time. Do you think, well, that's, as I said, very important, that's all there is to it? Because what happens when you're in the services, such as right now, is the exhortation from God's Word by such a preacher that there's a lot more to do than that. So you're not benefiting from what's going on when it's there, when you're there. Then there's the lack of encouragement. To encourage people is to say, well, they're on the right path but I need to see they stay on the right path by the example I set and by the words I say to them. Think of the parable of the sower. The devil immediately tries to snatch the seed of the kingdom from the one who is nearly taught. Well, does that give me uh, insight into the devices of Satan toward one who's nearly taught? Certainly. The Lord's already told us. When one is nearly taught the truth and is zealous over it, what's Satan going to do? Well, I don't know what he's going to do. Jesus told you. He's going to come and do all he can to make the word of God something that doesn't make any difference to you. He's going to steal it out of your heart. We need to be aware of all of that. We need to understand what we can do who are mature Christians to encourage people. Christians need to be even more urgent in encouragement in encouraging such a one. And one of the best ways to strengthen the young Christian, he may be chronologically 50 years old, he may be 12 years old, is by doing our best to live a godly life before them. That doesn't remove the importance of actual instruction in righteousness, but it shows them that if we can be faithful, they can be faithful. And that's very important. You know, a lot of times, though, what they see around is a bunch of hypocrites. And that's a shame. They don't know how to delineate things. They hear words people say, and that doesn't rhyme with what they know the Bible says. So we must be careful. When you read, uh, when you read Paul's statements to the Corinthians, he's talking a whole lot there about how they've got to be concerned about the other person's view of them. And a lot of the idea of an American is, I don't care what they think, I'm so and so. Well, if you have that attitude, you won't be faithful to the Lord. You won't set the right example. You'll do as you please, and you know where doing you please leads you, ultimately and finally and eternally. Often older members of the church disappoint you converts because one of the things about older members is they, they kind of go, I'm so happy to be a Christian. Are you headed that way? I hope you don't look the way I just described when you do it. But so many times, that's where we are. A marching to Zion. Beautiful. Well, if you're sick and half dead, then you can't help it. But why in the world are you trying to be dead before the time? We're going to die quick enough as it is. Life's a vapor and appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Get up and get off of yourself. Nobody told you to quit except you. <laughs> and did you learn that from your Bible? Did God tell you that? But that's the example that's set sometimes. It shouldn't be. It's wrong. It's not right. But a lot of times older Christians get that way. Oh, we should put that settled down and quit bothering me. And I like quiet and peace and be by myself. There's a, there's a place, and it's called outer darkness. And there's weeping and gnashing of teeth for people who will not keep on as long as they live every day, second minute, hour, right up till they die. Now, I'm going to have to say this because I'm not saying people can't reach a stage to where their health won't let them function as they once did. Just dismiss that. 
But have you ever read your Bible and noticed people in the great handicaps and yet they serve to be the greatest zealous examples of the cause of Christ? When you stop looking for things the church to do to spread the gospel and defend the faith, then there's something bad wrong with us. And it's not because we're chronologically older than the hills. It's our outlook on life. It's our attitude and outlook on ourselves. And that says, or it raises the questions of why, why do I view that about me? Why have I taken on that position? Then there's the wrong environment and improper associates that drag people away from Christ. The Bible tells us the evil companions corrupt good morals, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. No, no matter how many times that's read and preached on, people still go out and embrace those folks who don't care about the kingdom. Make them their best buddies. Will not turn loose of them. Hold to them. Follow them. Enjoy them. Paul told Timothy that everyone who named the name of Christ should depart from iniquity. Well, iniquity just doesn't happen on its own. People Practice evil. So if I depart from iniquity, I have to depart from those that practice iniquity. Thus, I've got to get away from them. What, what, they're my best buds. They're the devil's tool for you. If they won't listen, let me tell you how to find out what they are. Say, I want you to learn what I've learned. Will you study the Bible with me? And don't let them alone. And you'll see how fast they'll depart from you. You won't have to say, I don't have anything to do with you anymore. Just keep trying to study the Bible with them. When they cuss, rebuke them. When they tell a dirty yoke, stop them. When they tell an off-color story, stop it. You are the light of the world, aren't you? You are the salt of the earth. You are, aren't you? You're the leavening for good in the world, aren't you? Well, how are you going to do it? You see, we have the idea that I can just live the pristine example and never say a thing to this person right here. And some of the most interesting things I've had in my life is when you surprised a person and said, I don't hear that. Why are you saying that? Why do you even want to say it? You know, some people don't know why they want to say things. That's just the way, they don't know any better. Well, let them know that somebody knows better. Yeah, but that may get me fired. That may... Then you love the Lord. Let's just face it, you're just not really, you're just barely hanging on to the truth. You're barely, do you really even have a right to, to wear the name Christian, which means off Christ? Look what it cost the Lord to make salvation possible to us. And what was your mind when you partook of the Lord's Supper a while ago if you didn't consider that? And then you think in the spiritual body, we can just coast? Paul told Timothy to get away from all of this. 2 Timothy 2.19 Usually, by abstaining from the appearance of evil, that doesn't mean what looks like evil, it means every time evil appears, get away from it. You're going to find that means getting away from so-called friends because they don't depart from anything except good. Their principles of life contravenes pure Christian living, and you can't be associated with that. Not in the sense that your bosom buddies, best friends, and good pals. Such associates keeps the recent convert from putting first things first, which we must, Matthew 6, 33, if it happens to be our home. I remember one thing that and I did the best I could. I wish I could have done better in those days, but didn't know enough. But I knew what I ought to do. I was a freshman in college. Had a real good... English teacher, except a lot of times that department works hard on, on incoming students to try to destroy their faith in Christ and anything else, deity. That and philosophy departments. Uh, so this guy was good when he taught English, which was literature in that case. It was my second semester. Mr. Reed. But uh, he liked to come into class and act like he was madder than a hornet at everybody and slam things around and dare anybody to cross him but when he would finally get on teaching whatever it was he was there to teach is fine and i'll never forget after putting up that with semester we had our our final test he was sitting at the desk and i brought my paper up to him as each one would when they finished and put it down upon the desk i said mr reed i've enjoyed this class when you did what you were supposed to do in it in teaching i really enjoyed it but I said, all that other garbage you've talked about, no God and all that stuff, I said, you know better than that yourself. 
And he didn't say a word. He just looked up at me, got a smile, looked back down. You know, I was barely 18 years old. And I wondered all those years, if I could do that, no more knowledge than I had in those days. I've asked myself, the girl, why, why can't everybody else? Well, then somebody comes back and says, well, well, look at what you think you are. Folks, listen. If I understood at 12 years old enough about the gospel to render obedience to my Lord, why can't somebody else understand it? I'm not a genius. If you knew enough at your age to embrace the truth of God and humbly obey the gospel, if you're really converted to Christ, then why can't other people of your caliber understand it? And that's the way I reason with this. I know my heart and know where I was then and know where I am now and know how I got from there to here. And I know if I can have sometimes the courage just to walk up and, you know, sometimes I was sort of shaking my boots when I said some of those things. But who's going to say it if I don't? Hmm, let's see. Only a little boy David, only a babbling brook. What are you teaching your young people when you teach them that? Cute little song. Or as Paul said, whatsoever things are written before time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15, 4. So if you think I'm just tooting my horn, no, no, no. I'm not doing that at all. After all, we are to be patterns of good conduct to one another that we each can follow. So let me ask you this. When you go to work, when you go to school, and people act the idiot that they don't know any better than to act, they think that's normal, what are you going to do? Sit there with a thumb in your ear and the other hand with up your nose, cross-eyed? Or are you going to say something? Choose the time. But what are you doing? How are you a help to the Lord? How are you rebuking evil? How are you a leavening for good? Well, I might get in trouble. You know how the government is and how things are about talking religion. Well, when that happens, just think of those hands laid on that cross and that nail being driven right through there and say, but I can't do that. Where did we learn that we're not to suffer for the cause of Christ? I don't understand that mentality. I didn't many, many years ago. And I don't understand it today. And I haven't understood it in so-called Christians from then till now. I haven't understood it. Seems to me rather easy when you're going to sing about David. One little stone went into the sling. The sling went round and round. One little stone went up, up, up. And the giant beat the stuffings out of David because the stone missed. You know better than that. Well, why do we sing it? Why do we want these little ones to know? We want them to know what genuine biblical faith is and how it's seen in the life of people. And that you and God make the majority and you don't have to wait on anybody else. It's nice to have good examples to follow and I don't know how God has left us without that. I know I had them. But I know it takes a resolve on your part to step out and do what's right. And that's what's wrong with us today. We've learned to coast. And we think that's good. So it takes courage to turn our back upon the ways of this world, and the people in this world that hold us back, and to make a difference and to be different. Not for the sake of being different, but different because the Bible says when I believe and act like the truth of God teaches, I will be different from the world. Then there's just simply a failure to study the Bible, a failure to pray often. Well, our Savior left us two great avenues of potential spiritual power. We can look to God in prayer, James 5 and verse 16, and He talks to us through the Bible. Each case must mean that I will to let Him talk to me by learning how to study the Bible and ascertain the Lord's authority. And the other is that I have to set time aside to pray and to learn from the Bible how to pray and what I should pray and the attitude of prayer. But I just don't understand how that works. It works because you humbly from the heart keep his commandments. Well, how does he do that? I don't know. It never bothered me. I have an obligation to do, and when I perform it, God will take care of his. We talk about all this stuff that God can do, and he's omnipotent and omniscient and so forth, and then we try to say, but I just can't figure this out. Here he is without beginning or ending. He inhabits eternity. He made all that we see around us by the power of his word. He sustains all physical laws by the power of his word. He don't call it off. And then we say, well, I just can't figure it out. A whole lot of things you can't figure out, and you never will. But you can figure out enough to know that God is, Christ is his son, the gospel, and what it is, your obligations to him, and then do them. God will take care of all the rest. 
It's amazing to me how much worry we bring on ourselves trying to be concerned about things that have nothing to do with our obligations and the discharging of them. One cannot help but mature if he takes advantage of each of these opportunities in the study of the Bible, the practicing of it, and all that it says, but then in prayer to God. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 Are you? If you are, how do you know it? One of the major reasons so many fall away is their own unwillingness to partake of the spiritual food. We studied the book of Hebrews not too many months ago. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, the writer said, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat, do you know how many Christians aren't much beyond the plan of salvation and they couldn't tell you the plan of salvation? No wonder we can't get things done like God expects and he demands and we'll get account them day to him because we didn't. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That latter part's where it catches us. We've never approached the Bible as the guide for life from God and measured all things, discerning what's right and wrong and knowing the difference. A lack of Bible study is the real factor in spiritual apostasy. And this is why we urge every Christian to regularly attend Bible classes, to study daily the Word of God, to meditate on it day and night, to let it permeate your very being. Beyond this, we all need regular hours of study in our own homes. Going back to something I said a while ago, as far as older folks in the church, I mean Christians, of course, how is it that we can be what we ought to be in the study of the Bible and get around like the dead lice has fallen off of us? If one is regular in attending all worship assemblies of the church and having the attitude in them that we ought and doing the things from the heart that are there, and daily studying and praying and trying to examine one's life to see whether he be in the faith. Doing what's necessary to be repentant over whatever it is that's not right. Wanting to do better. Reaching forward and upward. Setting one's mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Planning and purposing to put into practice the particulars and practicing Matthew 6.33 then you're going to grow and develop. You can't help it. If you let those things fall down, if those, something else takes precedent, you put those back here at least in second place, then just expect to not be all God expects you to be. And you say, well, I wish I was better. No, you don't. If you did, you would do what it takes to be better. Oh, I wish my faith was stronger. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. How often do you study? A living, active, obedient faith. When you learn what to do, what do you do about it? Figure out ways to get out of it? You know, if we want this church to be here years from now, being what God expects the church to be, then it depends on what we do today to help lay the foundation for the future. We're saved to serve. Many evidently don't realize Jesus is their personal friend. It's amazing that when you consider how many people there are to pray to God that he hears me as if I'm the only one praying to him. That's because he's God and he's not governed by time. If somebody says, well, I don't know how God can tend. How, much, how does he give enough time to be able to do that? He's not governed by time. We're governed by time. God's not governed by time. He can take an interest in every one of us like we're the only one here that needs him. He's not governed by time. Quit thinking of God as a man. Regulated by time and space. Who are the faithful? Well, the real conversion has to be, be there first. Fellow Christians encouraging other Christians makes a difference. The proper environment and proper associates, studying the Bible and praying often without ceasing, a regular plan of petitioning God. And then recognizing my own responsibility. I can't expect you to discharge my responsibility. And Christians recognizing that Jesus is their personal friend and wants them to go to heaven has done all he can to make it possible. So what should be done to restore the wayward, let's say the prodigal? Plain, thorough preaching the gospel and the whole counsel of God pointedly and plainly showing how it applies to every person. 
The moment we see a member of the church drifting away, we need to go to him with exhortations, prayer, and if necessary, rebuke and exhibiting proper concern. Right there is where it falls apart. Folks, people can come regularly to this congregation, as small as we are, and then not come, and it'll be weeks before some people know they missed. And then, of course, then it'll be weeks later before anybody decides to try to do anything. By then, the person's dead. You know, the fellow drowns. You haven't got for so long to revive him. The one who has forsaken the Lord must repent and pray God that perhaps the thought of his heart might be forgiven. Acts 8, 22. And he's got to be brought to that state of mind to know he sinned. We're the ones to do it. If not, we don't love God. We certainly don't love our brethren. If all of these measures have failed to bring the erring member back to the fold, then church discipline, corrective church discipline must be exercised. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. In most cases, that's just not going to happen. And we'll lose our souls because we don't. God is calling the prodigal. Come without delay. Hear, oh, hear him calling. Calling now for thee. Now the question you've got to answer, are you that prodigal? And all you have to do is ask, am I living up to the obligations placed upon my shoulders? If you're subject to the Lord's invitation to become a Christian, believe in Christ with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, fully converted to Christ, rising as a new creature in Christ, growing and developing. As a child of God, are you growing and developing? Are you doing what you know you ought to do? I'm not necessarily saying you've not room to grow. Are you already consistently and steadfastly practicing what you know you ought to do? Whether you're elders, deacons, mamas and daddies, husbands and wives, whoever it is. Are you practicing what you know you ought to already do? And are you doing it consistently, steadfastly, with regularity in every case? That's the question. And of course, you know, God already knows the answer about you. But you've got to come to grips with that. And if you need to repent of sins, confess your faith, or rather confess your sins and pray God for forgiveness, then now is the time to take advantage of that second law of pardon that you can be what God wants you to be, that all of us can be in heaven someday and quit thinking because you've just been baptized. That's all that's necessary. Remember all those books in the New Testament written by God to all those Christians, teaching them how to be faithful. Are you subject to the call of Christ? If so, we bid you come while we stand and sing this song of invitation.